Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Kirk Stephenson, Miranda Janelle, That Charlie Dude, and our lifetime supporter, Eklund. Thank you for being with us all this time. On this episode of DTNS, Anthropic comes back up to bat in the AI space. How does Google's Find My Device stack up to Apple's? And what is a DAC, a D-A-C, and why do you want one? This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, June 20th, 2024. From Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. From Columbus, Ohio, I'm Rob Dunwood. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. And joining us today is Rob DeMillo, venture partner for Spark Labs Global and advisor to many other companies. Hello. Mm, Welcome back, Hello Rob. there. Thank you, Sarah. Hello, well, Rob. We know you're very busy. Again, yeah. Nice to see you, man. Yeah. So, yeah. Good to, ha- good to have you back. It's been a minute. Thanks. It, it's, it has been a minute. It's great to be back. Well, we're glad to have you. And kicking off that, we'll start the show with the quick hits. Former AI chief scientist Ilya Sutskever announced Wednesday that he's starting a new AI company called Safe Super Intelligence that will f- prioritize safety in AI. In a post on X, Sutskever said, quote, our singular focus means no distraction by management overhead or product cycles, and our business model means safety, security, and progress are all insulated from short-term commercial pressures. Safe Superintelligence currently has offices in Palo Alto, that's in California, and Tel Aviv, which is in Israel. Joining Scoot Kiver are co-founders Daniel Levy, a former OpenAI researcher, and Daniel Gross, co-founder of Q and a former AI lead at Apple. Reuters sources say the U.S. will announce a ban on the sales of Kapersky Labs antivirus software because the company's close ties to Russian government were found to pose a critical risk. The new rule, which includes adding Kapersky Labs to a trade restriction list, could affect deals globally. PayPal hired former Walmart executive Srini Venkaskadon as its new chief executive, uh, sorry, <laughs> chief technology officer, not CEO, CTO. Venkaskadon will oversee technology across PayPal's pal- platform, including AI and machine learning, information security, and project engineering. PayPal CEO Alex Chris said... As we execute our mission to revolutionize com- commerce globally, Srini's expertise leading technology, digital transformation, and AI personalization from inside some of our largest customers and partners will be invaluable. MoviePass, the movie theater subscription service that emerged from Bank Ruffy, with one of the original founders, Stacey Spikes, running the show, got a new investment from Comcast-owned consumer venture group Forecast Labs, although financial terms weren't announced. Forecast Labs will work on new customer acquisitions for MoviePass through TV advertising. MoviePass recently announced that a million movies have been seen through its platform and also said that it achieved its first profitable year in the company's history. Man, movie pass <laughs> coming back from the dead. A lot of people are excited about this. Yeah. A vote that was scheduled today to amend a draft law that may require WhatsApp and Signal to scan people's pictures and links for potential <clears throat> child sexual abuse material, also known as CSAM, was removed from European mm-hmm. Union countries' agendas. Three EU diplomats are telling Politico this. Ambassadors in the EU Council were set to decide whether to back a joint position on a regulation to fight this material. But Germany, Austria, Poland, the Netherlands, and the Czech Republic were all expected to abstain or outright oppose the law over cybersecurity and privacy concerns. All right, Rob, let's talk about let's talk about some AI. Let's talk about it. So Anthropic released its newest model called Claude 3.5 Sonnet, comparing it to OpenAI's GPT-4.0. It's designed to better understand nuance and complex instructions. Claude 3.5 Sonnet is kind of the middle child of Anthropic's authorings. Haiku is its smallest model. Sonnet is the middle or the mainstream option. And Claude 3 Opus is the highest end model. But Sonnet is touted as being twice as fast as Opus for what it does. 3.5 3.5 Sonic can also interpret charts and graphs with more accuracy and transcribe text from distorted images. Its context window is the same, 200,000, as version 3. 
Anthropic also released something called Artifacts, uh, which lets you create documents and then edit them within a single workspace inside Claude. So you can see what things look like, make edits if you want to, before kind of bouncing that out into something that you would use in the real world. Artifact generates the stuff to the side so you can make tweaks within the same window. Um, so for example, in a text document, you could make edits without having to copy anything outside to a, a external text editor type thing. With code, you get the UI and can tweak code to see how it affects the way that the program runs in real time as well. Cloud 3.5 Sonnet is available now for free on the web and iOS and on Anthropics, API, Bedrock, and Vertex platforms, paid users get 5x uh, higher rate limits. So um, as our AI journey marches on, and boy, we just can't get away from it these days, the models keep getting more capable, but we're also starting to see more incremental updates. Kind of feels like software updates. As Tom said in his newsletter today, if you haven't read it, uh, the artifacts feature is a really good example of how these companies want you to get them to use them instead of the competition, then pushing the competition to come up with their own better features. So Rob D. Uh, yeah. we, <laughs> what, we, uh, what's Rob D? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, I guess I can't do that. Rob with one B. Uh, 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 where are you in, in, in the AI race at this point? What are you using these days? So I, I've used them all and, uh, past jobs, future jobs, all this stuff. So I've, I've used, I don't want to say all, but I've used the big ones, right? So chat GPT, perplexity, um, um, anthropic, uh, Gemini <clears throat> out of, out of Google. And they're all sort of approaching this, this interesting little equilibrium point. Um, what Anthropic just released with Artifacts is kind of interesting in that I think it's their first step to sort of a conjoined workspace for a number of different people to be working within the same project. So right now it's it's interesting from the point of view that the Artifacts panel pops up on the side uh, and you can you know edit your documents in there and download them and do whatever you want, send them to other people. But it feels very much like this is like headed towards a... Um, a space where everybody's going to be working in the same workspace, which would be very cool. I had the same thought as Rob with one B. This looks like, it, are they moving towards collaboration um, with, with AI, with other humans potentially? And it, it kind of does feel like that. I think, um, however, is, you know, what's happening is that the fact that these things are updating uh, so often, um, you know, there, there's there's a few tools that I use that almost every time I log into them, there's some type of incremental update to where, uh, you know, these are cloud services. So when they fix something, they can fix it for everybody relatively quickly. And I think that that's going to be the same thing for AI going forward. So it's just interesting to see how fast they're putting out really big changes, but also how fast they're putting out just little incremental changes that give you a little side window that pops stuff up so you don't have to pop into another application. I think those kind of things are cool. I mean, how yeah. many times have we all looked at some software update of some app and been like, uh, you know, what are the developer notes here? Oh, okay. Yeah, got it. You know, but it wouldn't have been some big fanfare thing otherwise. I think with AI tools, there is so much fanfare because... Again, we have a handful of companies kind of racing to, you know, the front of the pack being like new stuff, new stuff. Some of this is really just like a software update. Mm -hmm. and, well, they're also being used. I mean, you use the key word there, right? They're being used as tools, right? Before they were toys, right? They, so uh, up until very recently within the last six months or so, they're, they're, they were things that people just sort of dabbled into like, oh, this is very cute. And then they never came back to it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and now we're at a point where these are being incorporated into workflows within office buildings, within research parks, within whatever. And uh, even for home consumer products, which we can talk about later if you want. But uh, it, it's they've they've gotten to a level of trust where people are using them in their own personal workflows and their own business workflows. And that level of trust is still a little squishy. But, you know, these these frequent updates, these frequent cloud uh, software updates are improving the accuracy and reducing the hallucinations. Um, and they're all sort of combating it in different ways, but, but the, the results that you're getting from these things are a lot more, uh, on point than they used to be. Uh, Rob one B, uh, question for you. I, I was talking to somebody, uh, about this the other day and, and they were like, 
Yeah, I use an AI tool every day of my life. Yeah. For some reason, you know, that's yeah. just what, you know, what I'm doing. And I don't feel the same. I I play around with everything because I want to know what I'm talking about, but do you feel like you're on a daily basis at this point? 1000%. Yeah. I, and and not only in my professional life, but in my personal life. I just got back from from an Italy trip and used it over there. It's like um you know, I'm going from, I'm going from Florence down to Tuscany. What's the easiest way to get there? Where's a good car rental place? And so it, it does all that for you. Sure. Um, it, right. As nicely as Google does, but it will also sort of print out an itinerary, which Google doesn't do. Uh, and I, you know, I just use it for everything. I've got, you guys know this, my whole house is one big IOT experiment. Uh, and one of the, one of the platforms that I used switched, um, from uh, uh, their drivers being written in in Java uh, to a language called Lua, which I don't know about, I don't care about, I have no interest in in learning another language that'll be forgotten in two years. Uh, and so I gave it my old Java drivers, I gave ChatGPT my old Java drivers, said rewrite this in Lua. And it did it, and I compiled it and put it on the platform and it ran, like immediately. Wow. It's kind of amazing, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say this about using AI every day. I don't intend specifically, I'm going to go use an AI tool, but I'm finding that so many tools I use just have it built in there that by default, I'm using AI darn near daily, multiple times a day, just because it's just built into everything at this point. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So let's change gears a little bit and talk a little about uh, Google's Find My Device Network. Uh, it's been available since April, but we're just starting to see reviews of the feature because third-party trackers that work with Find My Device are becoming readily available. Unfortunately for Google, the general consensus is that Find My Device is not that great for finding devices outside of Bluetooth range, which kind of defeats the purpose of the network in the first place. The problem isn't the hardware or even software. Find My Device Network is completely capable of finding devices. The issue stems from permissions. Unlike Apple, which turns its Find My Network on all the way when a default user sets up iCloud, Google is a bit more security conscious with the Find My Device set to with network in high traffic areas only, which requires multiple Android devices to pass by and detect its like in items location and only then shows you a center point triangulated from those reports. So my question for you guys is should Google take a page from Apple's playbook and fully enable the find my device network with Android by default? I mean, as somebody who uh, has lost various things on, uh, well, I, I was about to say the find my network, the Apple ecosystem, but I used Find My to be like, oh, there's my phone. It was under a pillow, you know, or, oh, those AirPods are two blocks over. I guess I'll never see them again kind of thing. I mean, it doesn't always work in the sense that it you get all your stuff back, but it works really well. Anything that is Bluetooth only, I, I guess, at least, you know, in, in an opt-in sort of way, feels like a half-baked solution. Well, well, Tile pulled it off. So I, I don't use yeah, Apple's solution. True. I don't use Google's solution. I use Tile. And all these things de depend on the network effect, right? So everyone has to be playing the game at the same time in order for these things to be useful. Uh, I've been using Tile for a couple of years now, and it, it tracks everything, like luggage across country, around the world. You know, It does a fairly reasonable job of doing it. Um, I actually... I'm of two minds about this because because Rob with two B's, you're you're absolutely right. They, they, it, if it was turned on by default, this would all be a lot easier to use. On the other hand, Apple has gotten into a lot of hot water because of the openness of, of their their tracking devices, and it's been used for for fairly nefarious purposes. Uh, and I think that's what Google's trying to avoid. So I think to that point, um, at Google, Apple absolutely has gotten into trouble. But one of the reasons that Google delayed their Find My Device network for so long is because they wanted to wait for Apple to catch up so that they could actually put, you know, some, you know, some joint code in, the, you know, these devices that allow you to see if there is a device that is following you that seems to be, you know, it's not your device, but it is, it's not your tracker, but it seems to be with you wherever you are. You can get some notifications for that. So Google actually waited on that. I think here it is, you know, it, they're saying that they're doing this for more security, but it is pretty secure. These things are as secure and in some cases, maybe even a bit more secure than what Apple has on its Find My, um, you know, Find My Network. So 
I think that if you don't turn it on by default, and they kind of do, they kind of half turn it on. If you're going to either half turn it on, you might as well fully turn it on. You know, if you want to be completely security conscious, just make it opt in, but don't make it opt in only half the way. I think that they need to make it opt in to where it will fully work. So if you have a tracker out there and just one phone Mm -hmm. walks past it, it can actually report in and let you know, Hey, here's one of my devices because they're not doing that. The, the, the network effect is just not happening because people have to consciously think about, Hey, let me go on my phone and turn something on so other people may be able to find something through it that's just not really going to happen and i think that you know i I wouldn't be shocked if google comes back at some point and actually makes it you know an about face or just a maybe a redirection on these on on these permissions so that the network effect will actually be of use to people i mean i think the the user case scenarios is the big part of this right um you know again on the apple find my version of this I have quite a few scenarios where I was like, well, you know, I didn't recover those AirPods. I guess my neighbor just has them in his house. Um, But um, but I know I know where things are. It works pretty well. I know where, you know, trusted people in my life are because we've decided that we want each other to know, you know, where we are, you know, in various uh, situations that that works uh, it for. It depends on what you want out of your life, right? And I think that Google being more conservative at the outset is not a bad thing. But I think you then get conversations like we're having right now of me being like, yeah, well, you know, I mean, out, out of Bluetooth range. I mean, that's that's yeah. useless. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you can I pay for high, higher cost devices that use Wi-Fi. Or, or, or use some sort of beacon system, but, but that defeats the purpose. You wouldn't get these little, you know, $60 devices. Yeah. Exactly. My, my dad, and this is a true story, recently just lost uh, his earbuds. And he had an idea of, you know, maybe three places of where he might have left them. So he called someone and said, hey, I think I might have left my, you know, my AirPods, you know, out in the garage. That person goes out in the garage and no sooner than they get out there, my dad can see on his phone, oh, that's where they are because they have an iPhone. He has an mm-hmm. iPhone and yeah. he has AirPods. They and got he's probably close doing, to it. He's doing it, the sound. It, it did what it was supposed to do. Right. That right. wouldn't happen with Google by default because they don't turn it on enough for that to happen. It could happen, but they need to fully turn it on. So I think in order for this to, you know, to move anywhere, they're going to have to fully turn it on so that people actually get the benefit out of it so that they will say, oh, this is what I want to use, or they'll just use other things. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, just to kind of wrap up this conversation, I mean, being able to track where something might have been left, you know, like your dad and the AirPods type thing, it's like, that's only step one. Step two is the person, maybe there isn't mm-hmm. a person on the other side of this, but if there is that person, they either kind of go like, no, I stole them. <laughs> I will not be working with you on this. Yeah. Or yeah. I don't understand what's going on here. I just like found this thing on the street kind of thing. Um, yeah. or there's no one, uh, at all. So it doesn't mean that this is some way to foolproof ever losing or misplacing or, you know, leaving something behind at a restaurant. It really isn't. It can be though. It can be. Yeah. Right. And, and, and the security issue that they're, that they're, trying to address is not that somebody can hack into these devices. Security issues more along the lines of you take one of these find my device trackers and you toss it in somebody's luggage or car. Right. And then if it's on, if, if, if everything is on by default, and this is the problem that Apple has, you, you can, if you're not a nice person, you can track where that tracker is at any point in time. Right. And that's what, that's what people are trying to avoid. Yeah, Absolutely. Um, well, uh, what we are trying to avoid is uh, making a show that you don't want. We want you to have the best show possible. Every year, we try to improve DTNS, and one of the things that we think is the best way to do that is asking you, the listeners, the viewers, what you like, what don't you like, what would you like to change, what could be better, what is absolutely perfect right now. DailyTechNewsShow.com slash survey is where we want to point you to, to take a survey. It just takes a few minutes. It's kind of fun. We, you know, we try to have some fun with the questions, 
but it helps us out a ton. So again, dailytechnewsshow.com slash survey. And thank you for everybody who's taken the survey and thank you to the rest of you in advance. Earlier this month, Statista, st excuse me, Statista Research published data showing that revenue from subscription and streaming music had increased to $14.36 billion, uh, that's U.S. dollars, in 2023, an increase from $13.2 billion in 2022. That's a lot of people listening to music digitally, either on their phones, smart speakers, or PCs. But Rob, you've mentioned, or you, did you have a method for folks who might be interested in higher quality experiences? Yeah. So, so when we were, and by the way, those statistics are backed up by CD sales and, and, and all the rest of it. But what has actually increased is, is vinyl album sales. And there's a reason for that, right? So there, there was a time when this was not even a conversation, right? Their analog vinyl was the thing that you use when I went to college, everyone had, you know, shelves and walls filled with, with albums that were not easy to transport, uh, you know, and they, they put the music on it. It, was, it would sound really great. Uh, and what happened in the intervening time was uh, you just you have to call it out, the iPod, iPhone, and, and, and the rest of it, where they came with these cheap little earbuds. And most people thought this was good enough. Um, and so the, those devices became the targets uh, for what audio was supposed to sound like. Um, and, and there's been, you know, I'm, I'm being a little disingenuous, there's been a lot of improvements since then in, in sort of the, the low end uh, side. But uh, there is another alternative um, for for people that call themselves and I and I hate this term audiophiles, right? Which is I, I want the cleanest, most exacting. Why do you copy hate the term? Because it's it's a it's a little snobby. It, it's it's more oh, it's like calling yourself yeah, like a foodie. I can hear things that the rest of you can type. Yeah, through. yeah, and there are people there are people that are like that. By the way, I I, I know people that claim to hear things that. There's no chance in hell you can you can hear that, but um, uh, but you know it, it's um, it, but there is some truth to the fact that as you expand the um, uh, abilities of these audio files uh, to to capture more and more information for playback, then you have everything else in the in the assembly line to get to your ears that have to be upgraded and changed. Right. And so if you're just working with MP3 files or AAC files or, or files that are they're, they're sort of limited in scope of what they can reproduce for your ears, you're fine. You can just pop on your earbuds and go to town or, or you know, wireless headsets or whatever it is. That you do. OK, so but so so the term DAC, um, mm -hmm. you know, you you threw out some, you know, AAC, MP3. What is DAC? <laughs> Character acronyms. But 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 true truly, you know, if if you care about audio, why does this matter? So a digital audio converter, which is what, what DAC stands for, um, is a way to take a, a digital audio file uh, and basically retranscode it to an analog format. So it's doing the opposite of what you do when you digitally record music, right? It's it's taking a digitally recorded song, album, concert, whatever, uh, and then retranslating it to analog so that rather than you know discrete bits of information, it's once again a nice pretty little sine wave that that hits your ears. And um, in order to do that, uh, a number of different things have to happen. Right. And one of the things that has to happen is that that original source material has to be recoded uh, and or recorded at a, recorded at a higher um, uh, frequency and bit rate uh, or it has to be translated there somehow. So there, there's there's two factors that you want to think about with this. Uh, one is um, uh, basically uh, uh, sampling rate, which is the original recording, how many times per second are the frequencies sampled and, and stored. And then the other thing to keep in mind is uh, the bit depth, which is how big is the piece of data storage that you've got uh, to store that, that new information. And, and so obviously the higher um, sampling rate and the higher the, the, the bit depth, uh, the more information you can travel, you can, you can capture. And then that, what is what gets transported to your ears and makes the DAX easier. It makes it easier on the DAX to take that information and, and give it to you. So, so, so Rob, are all DAX the same or, I mean, yeah. are they all doing the same job or are there different types of hardware for different types of jobs, different types of quality? 
Um, you know, what do we see there? Yeah, the, the, the variety is all over the map, right? So a, a strict digital audio converter, um, there are a number of different manufacturers that make these things. They all have slight different tweaks to the way these things work. Um, if, if, you, if you think about it, the, um, all these DACs have to do a lot of computational work uh, in order to recreate the, the, the audio as an analog output. So there, there's, there's straight DACs. Uh, there's also something called a streamer, which is no DAC. <laughs> so a streamer is, here is a digital audio source, and it could be the internet, it could be a file on your computer, and it's just going to pump that straight through as a digital source to wh whatever's going to listen to it. And then there's DAC streamers, which combine both of those functions, right? So it gets really confusing really fast, but you do, once you start to get into it and you sort of understand how you, you know, play with the Play-Doh, um, the, the, the sound that hits your ears, uh, it matters. And, and you can, you can tell the difference. If you've, if you've only been on Apple earpods your whole life or earbuds your whole life, and you suddenly put on a, a pair of headsets that are capable of supporting high definition audio, and you listen to songs that you've been listening to your whole life, you do actually hear the, the difference. Okay. So, um, for, for somebody who listens to a lot of podcasts when I'm out and about, because <laughs> I can't stay away from them, obviously, and music sometimes, mostly in my car, I feel mm -hmm. like a lot of this is lost on me. If I mm -hmm. were to be, you know, here in my studio with like, you know, I got good headphones, I got my, I got my DAC, you know, I'm raring to go. Are there, are there different options that will give me different results? Yeah, there are. First of all, if you're just a straight vocal listener, don't bother. It's there's there's really no real reason to to hear that your dulcet tones a little bit more clearly than than you would than the other <laughs> right. way, around. right? It's it's not it's not really for that. It's, Sarah's it's vocal for, fry is even worse. Yeah, yeah. Something's wrong with Sarah. <laughs> I can hear it in her voice. Um, so uh, yeah, you, so. It, it, if that's your if that's your jam, don't even worry about any of this. Um, if you are satisfied with listening to music the way that it sounds, don't bother with this. But if you are you want to be in your environment uh, and you want to be sitting in your favorite chair and and you know having your tea or your bourbon or whatever it is that you're, you you got, and you want to hear you know Tchaikovsky music you know, in, in in perfect clarity, then this is something that you should at least start to consider. Um, you can spend a lot of money on this, or you can spend a little bit of money on this. And like anything else in the world, like that slider, it talks about quality um, and, and, you know, eventually gets into nonsense if you get, if the numbers are too high, but uh, there's, there's a lot of different mixing and matching that you can do. I, I just got one, one last question for you. It, so you, you've got your DAC. Where do you go to get the music at, at that high? Ah. I, don't, I don't assume you're just going to Spotify or, or are you, you know, where are you going to get the music? Spotify is trying to get to a tier where they can do things like this, but they're not there yet. Um, there is an, a niche. Well, first of all, you can create your own. Like if you, if you have um, audio CDs, you can record them yourself. You can rip them yourself at a higher resolution. You can also go to certain online stores to buy uh, uh, audio copies of files that have been remastered at the highest possible quality. You know, it goes up to 192 uh, kilohertz for for the sampling rate, right? So it's 192,000 times a second. You're getting you're getting a frequency check. So you can buy things like that and and bring them to your home and put them on your servers or your computers uh, or your tablet or whatever, and 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 figure out how to play them back that way. There are also a number of niche. Um, uh, streaming services that will provide you with high quality audio output. Um, and uh, uh, Tidal is one, Cobuzz is another one, um, and then uh, uh, there's another option for you that will tie all of this stuff together. There's a product called Rune um, and another product called Plexamp, and I know I'm making it difficult for the people putting up the slides, but <clears throat> so both Plexamp and Rune will allow you to combine your sources. Basically, if you've got digital files at home and you've got a title account, for instance, you can mix and match those two things together uh, and you know, play me all the Led Zeppelin albums. And even if you do not have all the Led Zeppelin albums, it will, it will play them all and it will play them at the highest possible uh, 
audio output that, that, that you can, you, you can listen to. And so at that point, once you get that input, then it is up to you, the consumer to have the rest of the stuff in the food chain, uh, to get that, that instrumentation to your ears, the best possible way. Well, Rob, with one B. Um, this is fascinating. Um, let's continue this in GDI. Um, but uh, for 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 the DTNS audience, let folks know what what you're up to lately and where they can find your work. Uh, you can look me up at sparklabsglobal.com. Uh, I'm a venture partner there. We're doing a lot of uh, very interesting things uh, uh, going forward. Um, in, in the past, actually, but um, I am there almost full time now, and then I'm. Uh, doing a bunch of advisories for some other companies as well. Excellent. Well, um, always a pleasure to have you. Um, great conversation. And yes, for patrons, uh, we'll continue it in GDI. Speaking of patrons, stick around for our extended show. Good day, Internet. We're in an era where uh, hardware and factors are all over the place. Uh, we're talk talking about the latest Bluetooth tablet. Uh, it's interesting. Yeah, it's on our radar. You can also catch the show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com forward slash live. We'll be back tomorrow with Patrick Norton. The DTNS family of podcasts, helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>